So the message. is entitled Revelation and their Everlasting Gospel. I know I put a picture on there. You can see it uh, on the screen or you can see it on your screen on the corner there on the bottom. Uh, I know it's, it's kind of clickbaity, right, with the, the buildings and the fire and, and the whole thing. And that was on purpose because this is what people think about when they think about Revelation. Which is weird, because the book begins, if you, if you turn, and I hope you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. We're going to see what ought to be the main point of Revelation. And hopefully, if I do my job well, by the end of this message, uh, you will have a clearer understanding of that. But let's pray first. Heavenly Father, as we open up the Bible to study it, we understand that spiritual things are spiritually discerned. And Lord, this book is a special book inspired by your Holy Spirit. So we invite that same Holy Spirit to come into our hearts, to teach us, to speak to us, and to draw us closer to you and to help us learn the message that you have for us this morning. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Can you guys hear me okay? Can I have a little bit more volume even if it's just in here, just so I can hear myself a little bit better. Uh, so Mary Jane Lofton has also joined us. Uh, and uh, she's from the very first church that I pastored when I came out of college uh, there in, in Texas. Uh, so glad that, that she's here with us. And April Spicer has also joined us. Um, so just, yes, before I get into the, into the text, just another reminder that if you're watching right now live, feel free to share that to your page. And later on, if you want, you can go back and delete it. But just to let people know where you are right now, um, and perhaps this will serve as an invitation to someone who's searching. And God might use you to lead that person to a message that hopefully will give them hope. So I'm turning off my phone now to avoid the distractions. If you guys continue to sign on and comment, we have a team here that, that will be replying and interacting. Um, and I'm going to focus on the message now. If I could have, once again, just a little bit more volume, just so I can hear myself. Uh, if you guys can hear me fine on the, on the stream, uh, let me know if the volume is, needs some adjusting. But I just want to in here a little bit more. Um, thank you so much. That's better. So the Revelation, not a book about destruction, but rather a book that tells us about Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 1, I hope you have your Bibles with you at home. Bring them out, open them. I know you can do that in your computer as well or on your phone, but I, I like there's something about the paper and also the ability to underline and, and highlight. And I use color pencils because they don't bleed through. So anyway, Revelation chapter 1. Verse 1 says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant, John. You know, some of you, perhaps this is the first time that you're listening to a message being preached by a Seventh-day Adventist pastor. And this message, I guess, is about as Seventh-day adventist -y as it gets. You see, I say that because we see ourselves as, as a movement that has a special responsibility, a special mission, and that is to preach the three angels' message. Those messages are found in Revelation 14. Today, we're going to be talking about the first one, and the plan is next week to talk about the second angel's message, and then the following week, the third angel's message. Why is this important? Well, because Revelation 14 gives us the three angels' message, messages, and then right after that, we have the second coming of Jesus or the reaping of the earth's harvest. So we have this understanding. In Adventist circles, you're going to hear talk of uh, present truth. So we have lots of truth in the Bible, 
but there's usually some specific truth that's important that's significantly important for a specific period in time and we believe our understanding is that the three angels messages are the is the message that needs to be preached at the end times and i believe we're there no it's not doom and gloom it's not the end of the world it's not we're just seeing we're watching around us and we realize there's there's a special message during revelation and it seems seems to fit uh with our day and age and there's other prophetic clues to that as well uh, i don't want to get too much into that but if you look at our friday night uh streams and I'll, I'll talk more about that i guess later on this week stay tuned to our facebook page for some updates and our church website regarding our friday night revelation studies i want to find a way to get you the booklets uh, so that you can follow along at home but so here's the thing real quick we were just talking about the trumpets sounding uh last night from revelation chapter 8 and before that we talked about the opening of the seals and the scroll in revelation chapter 7. why am i mentioning this my understanding of it is that since the, jesus was crucified and went back into heaven it put into it started certain events here on earth and with the the destruction of jerusalem with the fall of the roman empire with the middle ages with enlightenment we see prophecies being fulfilled which bring us also if, if you're looking at the the early churches the, the the first churches the letters to the churches in the beginning of revelation you know that the church of laodicea or where we find ourselves if you look at the statue uh, in Daniel, um, we know we're at the feet where, you know, the, the Roman Empire crumbled. And I'm saying all of this to get to the point that when you look at Bible prophecy, we see that there aren't too many things left to happen before Jesus comes again. That's what I'm trying to say with all of this. So we have this message in Revelation chapter 14, and it's a message that you're not going to hear a lot of people talking about it. And I know why. Well, I think I do. I, I have some ideas on why that might be the case. It makes us uncomfortable. I've been praying a lot about this. Uh, I've been wanting to do, you know, a series on some other books in the Bible in the Old Testament like I did before with Genesis, like we did uh, with the book of Ruth. Uh, so we've, we've done these different things and I want to do it, but there's just something about what's happening right now and, and the need to preach this message and it's a message that makes people uncomfortable. But it's in the Bible. And I believe it needs to be preached. And one of the things that we discovered as we were doing our studies in Revelation is that God uses these events on earth for two reasons. Well, I'll, I'm going to highlight two. There's more than two. But one of them is to bring his people back to himself from sliding away. We see that with the prophets in the Old Testament. They keep telling the people, stop oppressing the weak, stop breaking the Sabbath, stop doing all these different things, you know, stop worshiping idols, come back to God. And then things would happen to sort of remind them, shake them up a little bit, bring them back to God. That's one of the reasons for some of these things that happen. Another reason is that these are signs to let people know that the end is coming that there is a day of judgment, that God is going to do what he said he's going to do, and now is the time to wake up and take more seriously your relationship with him. I'll get into these things in a little bit more detail. This is just a little bit of a, of a background, and it's hard for me to sort of let you know I find myself talking so fast and making all these references because that's where my mind is as I've been studying and as we have been going through this together. But let's focus right now on Revelation 14, starting with verse 6. And I hope that you'll follow along with me on your Bibles. It says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. We're going to stop there real quick. And, and just this idea of the everlasting gospel, right? The, the gospel being preached, this is directly related to Matthew chapter 24. So if you have your Bibles, 
with you. And if you can turn with me to Matthew chapter 24, this is when Jesus begins to sound uh, a little bit like, like the book of Revelation, uh, like, like John and, and his visions. Jesus is talking about things that must happen before the end because the disciples had asked him about that. And Jesus says in Matthew 24, verse 14, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. Last week, this was the focus of my message. You know, there is this, this gospel that's being preached at the end time. Why? Because of what Jesus said in Matthew 24, 14. The gospel has to go to everyone before the end comes. So we are, should all be involved in this. I'm preaching formally right now from a church. You're watching. Maybe you're sharing this video. Uh, maybe you just clicked on the video. And the idea is that after this, we will take this message, understand it, internalize it, and share with others. Not in the doom and gloom and scary type of thing, but rather as a burning desire to share good news with others who are searching. My friends, let me share with you. Uh, you know, as this virus is going around and, and people are wondering and people are scared and people are searching, it's, it's humbling, right? When we look around ourselves and we see the world brought to its knees by a virus that some would argue is not even that bad and others say, no, it's terrible. And as we're going back and forth, still everyone, every nation is being affected by this. It's affecting the economy. It's affecting our relationship with our loved ones. It's affecting how we travel, how we plan for the future. It's, it's having all of these problems. And here we thought we were quite... You know, we're doing well. We, were, we thought we weren't really that vulnerable. And it reminds us of how easily everything can fall apart. And with this in mind, it always reminds me, you know, whenever these things begin to happen, it reminds me we need God. We need a personal relationship with Jesus because everything we have in this world that we might lean on, it seems to not be able to hold the weight. You lean on it and it breaks. You lean on it, and it disappoints you. You lean on it, and it's not really there except for the rock that is Jesus Christ. So the idea of the gospel being preached is the idea that salvation is found in Jesus alone. This is the everlasting gospel. This is not a new gospel. This is something that's been around forever. And you can say, but pastor, the Bible there says clearly it was an angel flying in the midst of heaven. He had the gospel. Why are you telling us to do it? Well, here's an interesting thing. Angel really means messenger. Uh, the Hebrew is malak. The Greek is angelos. And they have been used in references to humans. I'm not going to go through all of these passages, but you can drop them down and look them up. 1 Kings 19.2, Haggai 1.13, Luke 7.24. In all of these passages, the word angel, either in the Greek or in the Hebrew, is used clearly referencing referencing a person an angel can be a description of a, a heavenly being but it also describes the function of a messenger and people can also be referred to as angels so it's not beyond the scope of interpretation to say that this here is a message that people are preaching full of the holy spirit as god's messengers here on earth it's not beyond the scope of interpretation to say that the angels are with us as we go and proclaim the gospel. Because this matches with what Jesus says in Matthew 28 where he tells everybody to go and to preach the gospel to the whole world. And he promises to be with us until the very end. Why? Because the gospel will be preached until the very end. So in the heart of of these angels' messages, you know, the, world, the end of the world is about to take place. Jesus is about to come. And what's the proclamation? The gospel. The everlasting gospel. The gospel that doesn't change. And we're familiar with the gospel, right? John 3.16 is, is the most uh, concise description of the gospel that Jesus gave to a religious ruler. And you know this by heart. For God so loved the world that he gave his only one-of-a-kind son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is the gospel. 
And I know, you know, I, it, I don't have a congregation in front of me. I don't know who's watching right now. My phone is off. But if, if you're from a different denomination and you're watching this, it could be that you have been told, you have been taught, and, and you, you, you really believe with all of your heart that God has saved people in different ways throughout history. Some people believe that, you know, in a way, God has been like upgrading the salvation plan. You know, it started, eh, it's not that good, and then he upgraded. It's, like, it's a little bit better, and then he keeps upgrading, right? There is the, you get into the ark to be saved, and then, you know, you offer a sacrifice, and then there was a sanctuary, and then there's different things. But when they look at Revelation, it says, no, 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 the gospel is one, and it's been there forever. And it's interesting, uh, for me, this serves as, as a clarification on this. If you turn with me to Mark chapter 14. So this is the gospel according to Mark, chapter 14. And, and just, you know, follow along with me and, and let me know if you think that this makes sense to you as much as it does for me. Mark 14, 35 through 36. This is talking about Jesus. He went a little further and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. Jesus is asking that if it's possible for him not to have to die on the cross, if there is any other way for people to be saved besides the gospel as it is found in Jesus Christ, if there is any other way, Jesus would love to have that take place instead of him having to die. And he said, verse 36, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Don't we say that sometimes? God, you can do anything you want, right? Take this cup away from me. And many of us would have stopped our prayer right there. And we demand that God, because he's able to do anything, we demand that God does what we want him to do, what we feel like God should do at that time. Let me tell you, at this point, Jesus felt like God should take this cup away from him. Jesus felt like he didn't want to die at this point. And I praise God that the prayer doesn't stop there. But Jesus says, nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. And because Jesus was willing to submit to the plan of salvation, we have this gospel to preach. So a couple of things from that text. One is that there was no other way. If we could have been saved by the sacrifice of animals, well, keep doing that. Why would Jesus have to come and die? There was no other way, which means the sacrifice of animals and everything that happened before that was never enough to save anybody. It was always by faith that one day Jesus would come. This makes this the everlasting gospel going all the way back to Genesis 3 when Adam and Eve fell and God made them clothing out of skins of animals. That means an animal had to die for, that, for their nakedness to be covered. The same way that Jesus had to die to cover us with his righteousness, which is Bible speak for saying his right being, his right actions, his right behavior covers my unright behavior. When I fall short, when I am selfish, when I mess up, Jesus' righteousness covers me and this is the gospel. He died so that I don't have to die and this must be preached all the way to the end. The everlasting gospel. People were saved by faith in Jesus from the very beginning. Just like we're saved by faith in Jesus now. So this gospel has to go where? To those who dwell on the earth. To every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. You know, you don't have to go back too far to when this was a lot more difficult. I remember reading about pioneers and missionaries who would get on a boat. And sometimes one of the most dangerous parts if you're going to go as a missionary overseas is just making it there. So many people would die on the ships because of, you know, what we're experiencing now. Viruses go very easily from person to person in the ship. And people would get all kinds of diseases and they die even before making to their destination. But the missionaries would go and they get there and there's nobody and they have to learn the language, and they have to adapt to the culture, and they have to adapt to, to the food, and, and then get to know them. And then years would pass before they could start sharing the gospel. And now, we can just share this video, and it goes around the world. 
there is messages being translated and being put out in so many different languages. The gospel is reaching the whole world at an advanced pace. This is prophecy being fulfilled. This is the three angels' message, the first angel's message taking place. This gospel is going to everyone who dwell on earth. And you know, I often would imagine this in my mind as a child growing up, you know, reading about prophecy. If you grew up in that she grew up listening to prophecy and i was thinking man imagine that missionary in the middle of the jungle somewhere in the world and he reaches that tribe and they listen to the gospel and they're the last ones and then jesus comes imagine what that would be like imagine being that missionary and you know what i've started to think about more recently imagine if the missionaries have reached everybody and the one person who hasn't heard yet is your friend from work it's your neighbor it's your family members because you haven't shared. You give money to the missionaries and you give money to the church and you, you do these different things, but you never take it upon yourself to share with somebody that's close to you. My friends, as I see this virus spreading around, I don't think it's the end of the world yet, but I think Jesus is giving us a reminder. I said these things would happen. How's your relationship with me? How are you going about that mission of sharing the gospel to the whole world? I see this as a reminder. And I want to put this uh, responsibility not only on myself, but to share with all of you who are watching right now. First of all, how's your walk with Jesus? How, have you accepted the gospel into your heart? Second of all, are you willing to be a part of this movement, this angel going out there sharing the everlasting gospel. It's the good news. It's what God has done in your life. Just share that with everyone. This includes people that disagree with you. This includes people who have different political views. This includes people who dress differently, talk differently, smell differently, do their hair differently. Yes, they need to hear the gospel as well. Yes, they should be welcome to church as well. Yes, you should share with them. And no, you should not unfriend them just because they have different political views. It's hard, right? We just want to surround ourselves with people who are just like us. That's natural. But let me tell you, the gospel is supernatural. It goes beyond the natural. Actually, it turns the natural upside down and says, do the opposite. That's what Jesus said. And this is why people avoid this because you see the gospel is being preached, but it gets worse on verse 7. You see, it's exactly when times are tough that the gospel has to go forward. It's when you're scared. It's when you're angry. It's when you don't feel like doing it. That's when you need to do it the most. And it has to go to everybody, including your enemies. They need the gospel too. Because if you don't think that they deserve the gospel, here's some news for you. You don't deserve it either. So why should God's grace extend to you, but not to your enemies? And if you're not willing to extend it to your enemies, have you truly accepted God's grace? I'm telling you, friends, with these things that are happening in the world, we can't be playing Christians. It doesn't work that way. It's time to show where we truly stand. These are reminders of things that are coming. Let's go to verse 7. Revelation 14, verse 7. Saying with a loud voice. So here's the gospel, right? Here's this message. It's coming. It's, you're saying this with a loud voice. The angel's proclaiming. He says, fear God and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Now, I've mentioned this before, if you're here for prayer meeting or if you're a member of my board. You know, I've been chewing on this message for a while and just, it's been ruminating in, in my mind. And I've just, I, I love the idea of, of the illustration that, that C.S. Lewis puts it on, on the Chronicles of Narnia when he portrays Jesus as a lion. Right? I mean, he's always the hero. He always shows up to save people. But it's always scary when the lion shows up. And, and I love this idea of God that, yes, he is good, but there's something just awesome about him that, that makes you tremble a little bit in his presence. Think about in Exodus 
when God shows up to give the law to the people and he's speaking, the mountain is shaking and there's lightning and there's a cloud and, and eventually the children of Israel go to Moses and say, please have God j talk just to you. Uh, otherwise, we're afraid we're going to die. No, it's not because God is mean. It's not because God is bad. I mean, this is the God that brought them out of Egypt. This is the God that gave them manna. This is the God that was is with them as a, as a pillar of, of cloud during the day and was a pillar of fire during the night. So this is their God. But they're afraid. Why? Because he's so powerful. So there's this idea of, of reverence and fear. And this is also tied to obedience and an understanding. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 22, verse 12. I find that the Bible... Uh, is very helpful in helping us understand the Bible. <laughs> so if you turn with me to Genesis chapter 22, there's an interesting um, interaction between God and Abraham. And I know this is a very challenging passage. I have a, a whole sermon on this. Uh, if you go to my blog, prmarlin.com, and search for Akedah, or if you just search for Genesis 22, it'll come up. Um, I go into a lot more detail on there. But right now, we're just going to look at verse 12. This is when God speaks to Abraham. Abraham was about to kill his son. And God says, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For I know that you what? I know that you fear God. So notice, Abraham's willingness to obey God to the point of, you know, that it didn't make sense. It showed that he feared God. It says here, I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. So this idea of fear God is how far are you willing to go to be obedient to God? And we haven't gotten there yet in our Revelation studies, and it's not the point of this study. But if you study Revelation, you're going to see that things are going to get pretty bad. And I've met more than one Christian that believe that when it gets there, then my faith will be strong and I will do the right thing and I will stand up for God. It's just that right now things are easy, so I don't really have to. So this idea of fear God, when you look at Abraham, his willingness to give up his only son, and God says, no, now I know that you fear me. You know, it, it makes me wonder if right now we give up our Christian identity and our core beliefs and our character just because of social pressure. I mean, your life's not even on the line. It's just, it would be awkward. If you're willing to deny God in that, do you really think you're going to stand when things really get tough? If you cheat now just to get the A on the exam, are you really going to be faithful to God when your life depends on it? You know, if you bend the rules now just to make a little bit more money, are you going to stand up for the truth when your livelihood depends on it? You know, I've, I've, I don't want to get into that. Those of you who are familiar with prophecy, you know, when you read about the mark of the beast and, and the, the impact that that will have regarding buying or selling finances, being able to provide for your family and all these things that will happen in the end times whenever those might start. Do you really think you can stand then if you don't stand right now? I believe what's happening around us is a wake-up call. What's your walk with Jesus right now, today, this week, last week, this semester in college or school or whatever level you are at? Are you faithful to God now? Can people trust you when you tell them you're going to do something? Is your word worth something? Can your spouse trust you? This is part of this command to fear God. Look at Psalm 111, verse 10. Let's turn there real quick. Keep your hand in Revelation. We're coming back. But Psalm, the book of Psalms, right about in the middle of the Bible, in most Bibles, 111, depending on how much stuff you have at the end of your Bible tacked on. Some have study notes and things. But Psalm 111, verse 10. Follow along with me in your Bibles. It says, The fear of the Lord is what? The beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who what? Do his commandments. His praise endures forever. So the fear of the Lord is tied in with obedience, with living your life in a way that, you know, it, you, you honor God through the, through the things that you do. Fear God and give glory to Him. 
Do you praise God? Do you glorify God through your behavior, through your kindness, your benevolence, your willingness to forgive, your willingness to serve and to help those who have no way of retributing, of paying you back for the good that you have done? Do you go around making the world a better place, reflecting the love that you receive from God? Do you give glory to God in the way that you live your life? I was preaching at Warner Robins uh, a couple of weeks ago, and there was something that one of their elders said that, that made sense. It was during the, the praise and worship time. He, th- he said, imagine if God blessed you to the extent that you sing praises to him. You know, you're singing there, sitting there, mumbling along through the praise songs. Imagine if God blessed you to the extent that you're excited about him. I mean, you cheer for your favorite team, right? You cheer for for all these different things. Can, Can we get excited? Do we praise God? Do we worship him? Now, here's the thing. It says, give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. And this is, I think, is the main reason people don't want to talk about the three angels' message. It's in the context of judgment. And judgment is something we don't want to talk about. We're all about don't judge, right? Don't, don't judge me. And the idea that God will judge or is judging makes us uncomfortable. So we just don't talk about it. Some people even want to interpret revelation in a way that makes God's people not have to deal with judgment. Somehow they skip it, even though throughout the Bible, God's people face judgment. And we're going to talk about that because I don't want you to be scared about judgment, but I want you to understand that it is in the Bible and it is something that you can't really turn away from when you read from Genesis to Revelation. It's there. Turn with me to Ecclesiastes. Now, this is a little book. After Proverbs, uh, and some people love it, uh, some people not so much. It's kind of a downer, uh, you know, it kind of reminds you that everything in life is meaningless outside of God. But, you know, let's, uh, this is not a sermon on Ecclesiastes, but we are going to go to the very end of Ecclesiastes. Chapter 12, verse 14. Well, I'm going I'm to start with verse 13. I'll do 13 and 14. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, starting with verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is man's all. You're wondering what life is all about? Fearing God, keeping his commandments. Well, why? Verse 14. For God will bring every work into judgment including every secret thing, whether good or bad. And then this is when you click away from this video, right? Ah, he's preaching salvation by works. Click. I just read from the Bible, but you know, I disagree with this. Click. Hear me out before you click. That passage is there. We can't ignore it. But there are other passages that will give us a fuller understanding. But that is true nonetheless. If right now you're living your life as if there's things that you can do and you don't have to repent, you don't have to turn away from because it's just this little thing, nobody else knows, nobody's seeing it, and God is not really going to notice it either. Well, Ecclesiastes says, no, no, God's going to notice and he's going to bring it up. Everything, every secret little thing. There is no hidden sin. I don't care what time of night, in what room, uh, with what, whatever software you have to erase your tracks, God is watching. Whatever you do with your funds, whatever you do with people, whatever you, God is watching. And the gospel is being preached in this context of judgment. And the idea is now is not the time to be playing around with sin, thinking that it doesn't matter thinking that it doesn't hurt anybody, thinking that nobody's seeing, thinking that it's okay. You know, we're going to sin until Jesus comes back. This is my favorite sin. This message of judgment reminds us to not try to hide anything from God. But there is more. Psalm 32, verse 1. And I I wanted to use an Old Testament passage so you don't think that this is a a New Testament update 
to theology, but rather that it is a consistent gospel throughout the Bible because God is consistent. So Psalm 32 verse 1, this is David, and he's writing, Blessed is he, blessed is the person whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is so let's put these two verses together, right? In Ecclesiastes, we read that all of the sins, everything that you do, I did not all the sins, everything that you do, good or evil, is going to be brought up. But then David adds more to that. Actually, David wrote this first. His son wrote that later. But, you know, there is this common understanding that there is a state of being blessed, for everyone whose transgression is forgiven and whose sin is covered. Now, when God forgives, when God covers the sin, guess what? It doesn't come up in judgment because God is the one that covered it. You can't cover it. I can't cover it. The church can't cover your sins, but God can. So in a sense, if you are coming to Jesus and say, Lord, I'm struggling with this. You know, right now I've been staying home. Uh, you know, everything has changed. I'm, I'm feeling uh, anxiety. And the way that I self-medicate, the way that I soothe that is by indulging in these things that I shouldn't been doing. But Lord, I'm scared. I don't know what to do. I'm struggling. Help me. There is hope for you. But if you're excusing yourself, when somebody catches you and you're saying, well, you know, it's, these things are going on and it's just hard and, you know, it's, it's, I mean, it's none of your business, first of all, and, you know, nobody's perfect, and, and you find the excuses, to you, the angel is saying, the hour of judgment has come. Stop making excuses. Come clean before God. Je uh, Jesus, David is saying, there is a blessing there when your sin is forgiven. When your sin is covered, when your transgression is forgiven, the Bible promises that God will forgive those who confess their sins. But you have to confess. And this is where I see the power of the angel's message here in Revelation 14, is that he was reminding us, do you have unconfessed sins? Are you secretly indulging in something? Stop it. <laughs> Turn to God. Ask for forgiveness. Ask for help. Get an accountability partner. Change your routine. Do what you need to do. But the hour of judgment has come. Stop messing around with sin. Not because you are afraid, but because you love Jesus and you don't want his sacrifice to go to waste. The hour of judgment has come. Let's look at Daniel chapter 7, verse 22, because there's something really interesting there regarding judgment that is also worth keeping in mind as we read uh, the first angel's message. Daniel chapter 7, verse 22. I'm going to start with verse 21 just to give you a little bit of context. I was watching, and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. And then verse 22, pay attention to verse 22. Until the ancient of days came, and the judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time for the saints to possess, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. And then there's a, another description of the same thing with the idea of the kingdom of God being established. In the end, uh, if you want, you can skip forward to verse 26. It says, But the court shall be seated, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it forever. Then the kingdom and dominion and greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey him. So in Daniel, it's telling us when judgment takes place, you know what happens when judgment takes place? God's people receive their reward. And all the wicked who have rejected God, persecuted God, and openly said, I'm not interested in have anything to do with God. Finally, they will get their reward and we will get our reward. But that reward only comes after the judgment. Does that make sense? The judgment is a message of salvation. It means an end to all the suffering. I mean, look around yourselves. 
As we look around ourselves, at least here in the United States, and I know it's true in other places as well, you know, there's so much tension in the politics and different things, and, and everybody has a different solution, and none of the solutions work. People get angry with each other for disagreeing. I don't want to get too political because that will make you click away as well. And it's not the focus of this. But the idea is the solution is only coming from God. He has to come in and to judge. Because the good and the bad are mixed and there seems to be just a whole lot more bad than good. And prophecy says it's not going to get better. I believe this virus is a wake-up call to remind us, how am I walking with God? Am I willing to stand on Him even as there's all these pressures and these different things, understanding that after judgment is done, I'm getting these rewards. God is going to set everything straight. He is willing to cover my sins if I am willing to confess them. Am I walking with God or am I just playing the part and hoping that nobody will tell, that nobody can tell that I'm a fake? And finally, we come to the last part of the first angel's message. He says, And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. If you follow our study in Revelation, you see that the whole battle here is about worship. We haven't gotten there in our study yet, but verses 12 and 13 talk about what what some have called the satanic trinity are doing, you know, the, the dragon and the beast from the land, the beast from the sea and all that. I'm not going to get into that right now. And then on chapter 14, we see the other end. What's happening with God's people? What are they doing? They're going, they're preaching this gospel. And the whole thing had to do with worship. Because in the previous two chapters, either you worship the beast in his image or you're persecuted. And here we have God's people calling people to worship, not the beast, not its image, but the Creator God. So then the question comes up, and I might step on some more toes here, depending on who's watching. Look, I don't know who you are, so I'm not preaching this to you specifically, but if you clicked on this, uh, pray about it. Maybe this is something for you to consider. The way that we find out who we're supposed to worship is connected here with the Creator. Him who made heaven, earth, the sea, in the springs of water. And you can go in your favorite Bible software, highlight this phrase, uh, who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and do a search, see how many times it comes up. And you're going to see that it comes up several times as a reference to God. People are wondering, who is God? Remember when Moses shows up to Pharaoh and says, God is saying, let my people go? And Pharaoh said, who's your God? Who's, it's, I don't know him. I'm not going to let your people go. I am God here. He may be God somewhere else, but I am God here. And then God shows him through the plagues and different things that he is God. Something similar happens in the last days. People are wondering, who is this God? I'm not going to worship this God. And then God shows them through the plagues, similar to what happened in Egypt, you know, that he is God. But here's another interesting thing that you will notice. There is almost... It's almost like John is quoting from another verse in the Bible found in Exodus chapter 20. Let's turn there. Turn there with me and, and tell me if you agree that it's, it's such a coincidence, right? It's, it's incredible. Um, Exodus chapter 20. It says in verse 11, For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea. Made the heavens, the earth, the sea. Exact same phrase. Only shows up exactly like that in these two places. It does show up in other places separated with some other words in between and some other things. It's always a description of God. But here's an interesting thing. Let's talk about Exodus 20 a little bit. Because here God is establishing himself who he is and the reason for people to do something and i have to talk about this and i'm going to talk about i'm going to read it first and then talk about it some more let's start with verse 8 it says remember the sabbath day to keep it holy remember that in revelation the whole thing is about worship 
here we have the only commandment that says remember. If God was establishing this for a specific people for a specific period of time, he could have said, and you shall keep, or you shall not work, or you shall, you know, something like he did with all the other commands, you know, regarding the sacrifice. And you will take the lamb, and you will cut this part, and you will burn this, and you will burn that, and you take this out, and you... Right? He, he just gave them step-by-step -step directions. This is for you. This is what you're going to be doing. When the temple, when the veil in the temple splits, that thing ended. The, the temple services were gone. But we have here in the Ten Commandments something different. Something that goes beyond the, the sacrificial service. You see, because long before we get to Exodus 20, we have been receiving the manna. The people of God have been receiving manna. And guess what? The manna fell six days a week. On the sixth day, they got twice as much. And on the seventh day, it didn't fall. Before the Ten Commandments. And God is saying here, remember, He's not establishing something. He's reminding them of something they should have never forgotten. Something that in the slavery of chasing after, of having to serve a master, you just forget. But God here is saying, remember, you are not slaves. You have been set free. Keeping the Sabbath is not slavery to the law. It's a reminder that God sets us free. Sets us free. It's a reminder that we worship the Creator. Because if you move that aside, then who do we know who to worship? How do we know who to worship? God was different from everybody else because He is the Creator God who made the heavens, the earth, and the sea. Let me read the whole commandment for you. Remember the seventh day, the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. Just you who are Jews. Right? Actually it says you. Nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant. But what if my servant from a different land? Well, we'll keep reading. Nor your cattle. I, I guess cattle don't have a religion. Nor your stranger. Oh, here we go. Here's the foreigner, right? Somebody that's coming to visit. They don't worship the same God. They don't go to the same church. They're, you know, they're just visiting. Who is within your gate. So if they're within your sphere of influence, they get the Sabbath off. You don't get to bring a stranger in and make them work on the Sabbath. Well, why? Well, because in six days, the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water, uh, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord did what? Blessed the Sabbath, and made it holy, hallowed it. So God blessed this day. God rested on this day. God tells us to rest on this day, to remember this day. This day has been there from creation. And that holiness and that blessedness is never transferred anywhere else. So if there is a command to worship God in the context of judgment, in the last days, let me ask you, do you think this is relevant? To worship God on the day that he set aside from the beginning, the day that reminds us that he is the God, the day that identifies him as the God because he is our creator. You see, all of heaven worships God because he's the creator. Now, we from earth, we have a special song that we'll get to sing, the song of the redeemed, that the others don't get to sing because they don't know what it's like to be redeemed. So that is a part of it. The resurrection is beautiful. I think it's what proves God's love to the whole world and keeps sin from ever coming up again. This is my own interpretation. Whenever people think about sinning, like, should I really follow God? Is he really good God? You'll see that the marks on his hand that Jesus kept after the resurrection. Be like, oh yeah, he died for us. He is that good. So I'm not denying the cross. I'm not denying the resurrection. I'm just saying the God that we worship is the creator God. And what reminds us of that is this day that he set apart from creation before there was sin to spend with him in a special relationship. The Sabbath is not an Adventist truth. It's not a Jewish teaching. It's about worshiping God. I can take you through the Bible. I won't do it now. From Genesis to Revelation and teach the Sabbath. But where would you stand First, to do away with that, and second, to replace it with anything else. I'd be interested. You can send me a special uh, a, a message if you have any questions about this, if you're really searching, because here's the thing. I've studied this with so many people, different religions, denominations. I've talked about this with different pastors. They come up to me and talk about it. And you know what? 
I, I've never, I, I should, can I say never? Uh, it's hard to say never. But I can't think of anybody that ever walked away unsure. I know Pastor said, like, yeah, that's what the Bible teaches. It's clear. It's there. People have found it on their own. It's just, it's uncomfortable. You know, everybody else does it differently. And uh, do I really have to? And it doesn't matter. And tell yourself what you want. I'd just like to read to you again from Revelation 14. Saying in a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. You see, this is the God that's going to give victory to his people. This is the God that will provide for his children in the last days. This is the God that gives me peace when I don't know what life is going to look like a week from now, a month from now. I don't know how long this is going to take. But you know what? I lay down that bed and I fall asleep. Because it's not my problem. I worship the creator God. And he has provided for me up to this point. And there's been some scary moments in my life. And I'm sure you have experienced those in your life too. But if he has provided for me up to this point, and I trust him to provide for me to the end, I can rest. I can take a Sabbath rest on the day that he has set aside. I can lay down and sleep at night because God is my provider. I am not afraid of judgment because Jesus' righteousness covers mine. But I cannot deny the reality of a judgment. And I cannot deny the reality of an end of the world that is coming. But I can walk confidently towards it because it's not about me it's about my god who gives me victory step by step so this is the good news the everlasting gospel that goes to the whole world in this context of judgment and of worshiping the right god i don't get to pick the god i don't get to pick the worship he chooses that i align with him because he's the one that gives us the victory he is the lamb that was worthy that was slain and is worthy to you know to take charge and to judge the world because you walked here as one of us and there is more to that, and I might be talking about some other things regarding Revelation in the end. Um, but for now, uh, you know, the good news is that salvation is still available right now. Maybe you haven't thought about some of the things that I mentioned. Maybe you're going to be studying it, looking into it. Go for it. Prayerfully do so. Find out if this is just a me thing or if this is a Bible or a God thing. But what I ask you and I plead with you and I warn you that please wake up don't be asleep don't go around with life as usual because it's not don't play with sin in the context of judgment right now is the time to be all in with God preaching the gospel coming to him when repenting and confessing receiving from him his righteousness and the assurance of salvation not based on your works but based on what jesus did looking forward to his soon return knowing that there will be challenges getting up to that but looking forward and preaching the gospel because it's what he calls us to do and because he guarantees our victory and my friend it's going to be glorious to be god's chosen people receiving his victory regardless of what's what's happening around us because he has called us and because he's the one that provides for us that's the god that we worship the creator god so i ask that you join me in opening ourselves up to god and seeking him every day you're spending more time at home now perhaps spend more time with god whatever that might look like in your life let's do this together and tune in next week we're going to be going deeper into the second angel's message. And pray for me that God will give me boldness and wisdom that I may do this the best way possible because I want us to be ready because God holds me accountable to reaching you with this message. Share with others. Join us again. We're going to be back here on Wednesday night for our prayer meeting. And I'm still thinking about what I'm going to do about our Friday studies in Revelation. But we're, we're making plans you know, we're trying to do what we can. I ask that you join me in doing what you can. What is God calling you to do? How can you spread the gospel during this time? Because it's time to wake up. It's time to get serious. It's time to turn to God and receive from Him the salvation and then go with Him forward in the mission. Amen. 
Thanks for watching. If you're blessed by that message, hit the subscribe button so you don't miss any of them. We try to post every Saturday at 6 o'clock. Also, hit that like button, comment below, share with your friends. We try to read the comments and reply as possible. And may God bless you.